Hi, everyone. I do try to update my lectures at least once a year. And the next one, chapter 11, which is adaptations during pregnancy or the changes our body goes through during pregnancy hasn't changed a ton. Um, just a few little uh, insights, but I have re-recorded it. So let's get started. So here we are, chapter 11. And we're going to start talking about some of the outward signs of pregnancy. Now, these aren't normally used in the everyday world, but these are NCLEX style questions. These are the things that they ask you about. And they're in your textbook and you can spend some time looking at them. I'm gonna go through them quickly. You have Chadwick sign, which is the changing of the color and the mucosa of the cervix. You have Goodell sign, which is the softening of the cervix and Hager sign, which is the softening of the lower uterine segment. And these were things that were utilized by um, physicians and midwives before we had pregnancy tests, um, ultrasound, that sort of thing. And this is just an example of what Chadwick sign would look like. And this is testing for um, Hagar sign. Now, NCLEX also loves this question. They are forever asking about presumptive signs, which are subjective, positive signs, uh, probable signs and positive signs of pregnancy. And so you'll wanna go through and make yourself a note card or something to try to remember these. And basically what this is saying is presumptive signs. If you have these signs, you may be pregnant, but there may be other things that are causing this as well. So that's why these are um, subjective, what the patient will tell you. So um, fatigue, breast tenderness, nausea, vomiting, amenorrhea caused by other things besides pregnancy sometimes and urinary frequency. And these are the uh, weeks of pregnancy that you might see them. Presumptive signs, hyperpigmentation of the skin, fetal movement, uterine enlargement or breast enlargement may also be um, signs of pregnancy, but other things could be causing them as well. Um, so we assume you're pregnant if you have these things, but not always, not necessarily. And probable signs, um, Braxton Hicks contractions, positive pregnancy tests, abdominal enlargement, velodiment, Goodell sign, Chadwick sign, Hagar sign. And here are the different pregnancy tests that we actually use. This is new as of this video. Um, you can see what it is that we're, we're testing for when we're using these different pregnancy tests and positive signs. So the only absolute 100% sure way we know that someone's pregnant is to visually see the fetus, to hear heart tones, and for the fetal movement to be felt by someone else because um, all those other things could be explained by uh, different disease processes. We even use pregnancy tests um, for some male uh, conditions beyond the scope of this course, but there is uh, sometimes that we can see positive pregnancy tests in males. So the uterus is going to change. It's going to change in size and weight and length, and it moves from um, a pelvic organ to an abdominal organ. You're going to see increased uterine contractility. Uterus is a muscle and it will increase its ability to contract as the pregnancy continues. Um, and we start to measure the fundal height, which I'm gonna show you what that looks like here in just a minute. We start to measure the fundal height and estimate the gestational age based on the fundal height. Now, again, that is um, subjective and can change. So as the uterus starts to grow, it moves from a pelvic organ up into an abdominal organ and about the 20th week of pregnancy, it will usually meet the um, level of the umbilicus. And so uh, we can kind of estimate how pregnant someone is based on where this baby is. Now, of course, that's going to change if there's multiples or if there's um, some growth restriction issues. So you can see why the body, why a mom's body is uncomfortable when she's growing a baby, because here she is non-pregnant. She, she has lots of room in her body for all these organs. And here she is pregnant. When you're growing a human outside here, your bladder is squished, 
your back is swayed, your bowel is squished, your intestines are squished, your stomach is squished, your liver and your lungs and your diaphragm. So everything has to move out of the way in order for this fetus to have room to develop. So again, um, changes are going to be happening in both the cervix and the vagina. You can take a look at these um, different changes and make yourself a little note card that you can study before you do your NCLEX. The ovaries are also going to change. We're going to see a cessation of ovulation. So no more eggs are going to be grown and, and released at that point. The breasts are going to change. In fact, our breasts do not continue or finish development until we actually become pregnant for the first time. And this is when we're going, the, the hormones of pregnancy are going to help to develop the um, tissue and the glands that are going to be milk producing. The very first milk we call colostrum, that is just the early milk that is being made. It is very antibody rich. It is um, uh, usually very thick. And many women will see the production of colostrum during pregnancy. It may even have some leaking from the breasts. It, it's okay if you don't see that, but it's not uncommon to see that. So here is just an example of how the breast is going to change shape and how these glands are, uh, and tissue are going to develop. This is a, an example of how the uterus is going to change and about the gestation of when you're going to see those major changes. And once again, a picture of how this baby has to fit inside this body with um, all the existing organs that are in there. And now you see why a pregnant woman has to pee all the time because she literally has the weight of the baby on her bladder. A very nice picture borrowed from the internet of someone that put it up there about what it looks like um, during the course of pregnancy. You're going to see GI system changes. Um, hypersalivation is not uncommon. Sometimes the gums can be swollen, friable, increase in gingivitis. The, there's a decreased peristalsis, which is why we see more constipation in pregnancy. Um, we have more heartburn in pregnancy because of the pressure of the baby and because of that decreased peristalsis. Prolonged gallbladder emptying, we frequently see gallbladder or gallstone issues along with pregnancy. And of course, the nausea and vomiting, which are caused from the hormone changes that are happening in pregnancy. Cardiovascular system is going to change. We are going to have an increase in blood volume. And when we have that increase in blood volume, all the components of the blood are going to be decreased because we now have more blood volume. And I have another slide that's going to show you this. There's an increase in cardiac output. Sometimes women that didn't know they had a cardiac issue will discover it during pregnancy because of this excess blood volume and this excess stress and strain on the heart. Um, we see a slight decline in blood pressure until about mid-pregnancy, and um, we have an increase in iron demands. So if you look at this slide, and you can see that I have um, given you the information where to find this slide, but if you have an increase in blood volume, but your red blood cells say red blood cells stay the same, then we're going to have a decrease in our hematocrits. We call this the physiologic anemia of pregnancy. So oftentimes women will say, oh, I'm anemic. Well, is it just the anemia of pregnancy because you have more blood volume or were you anemic before you became pregnant and our, our, that condition has increased now? So it's very, very common to see um, a decrease in our hematocrit. We do recommend iron rich foods and um, uh, different things to help keep their iron stores up. Some women have a very hard time actually taking iron supplementation and the provider is going to decide if she needs that. But here are some um, common foods that increase iron production. This is steel cut oats, I believe, and this is lentils. Um, and so respiratory is also going to change. We're going to see an increase in oxygen consumption because she is breathing and working and doing oxygen exchange, gas exchange for two people now. Uh, we do see more diaphragmatic than abdominal breathing and we see more congestion it, which comes from our um, increased vascularity. So lots of women complain about having stuffy noses and um, a little dry cough. They, they 
feel more congestion in their sinuses. Um, looking at the musculoskeletal, you can see that we definitely have some changes in the curve of the back as the baby starts to grow. Women change their center of gravity. They're prone to falling, prone to um, losing their balance because of that. We also know that the pelvic ligaments and joints are, are going to become loosened up from that relaxing hormone that I've talked about previously. Our urinary system is now going to um, have some changes as well. It, there's an increase in length and weight of the kidneys, and there's an increase in kidney activity when women are laying down. So we want to um, make sure that women are, are very well hydrated so that they can keep the um, blood flow going through the kidneys that helps you know, rid the body of all the excess waste products that they're getting from the baby. And it is very important that they stay hydrated and not become dehydrated, um, and, which is very easy to do in pregnancy. And this is again, um, by osmosis, and it's looking at the differences in our um, uh, kidneys during pregnancy. The spine is going to have a lot more stress. This is why we see that lower backache. The pelvis is going to be, change its shape. And so that contributes to that lower backache. So making sure women are using good body mechanics and especially if they're working up until the end of their pregnancy is um, important. And this is showing you uh, all the differences that I've been talking about in the pictures for the musculoskeletal changes. Integumentary changes are going to happen, and these are related to hormones. I have some pictures of most of these things. Women are often very concerned about the hyperpigmentation that happens on the skin, uh, especially the one that happens in on the face. And um, let's go through. Now, the textbook, and I need to actually do some research on this, this talks about a decline in hair growth. Most women, and in my own personal experience, um, I, we had, I had an increase in hair growth, especially, um, in the thickness of my hair on my, the top of my head and, in you know, how, how well it grew. So I don't know why this mentions a decrease. I, I have wanted to check that out for years. So I'm going to have to look into that and we'll discuss it. So these are, um, some increased vascularities that you might see often referred to as varicose veins. These can happen in the legs. They can also happen in the labia. Remember there's that increase in blood volume. So if you, if they run in your genetics, if they run in your family, or if you have a profession like say nursing that, um, it, it encourages the production of these, you will see more of it during pregnancy. They can even be up into um, other parts of the body, including the labia, which can be extremely painful. This is that mask of pregnancy called colosma. Typically will go away and fade after pregnancy, but women can be very concerned about this. Um, there is uh, an increase in the pressure from this uterus. It's putting pressure on these veins. And so this is why we see an increase in the varicose veins and swelling in the lower legs and ankles. We're going to talk more about that when we talk about the problems of pregnancy, but this is a common occurrence. So we do recommend um, sitting down, putting your feet up, taking that weight off as often as possible, especially in late pregnancy. Here is that Linnea Negra. That is the line that goes on the skin and you can see on different colors of skin, different shades of skin, it will look different. Um, sometimes it's very linear and sometimes it you know, moves over a little bit, but this should fade after pregnancy is over as well. And here are those dreaded stretch marks. They come on from the rapid growth of the skin stretching and they start off kind of this red color and for some people, some people don't get any at all. And then once they go away, they fade to this color, kind of a silvery, um, uh, whitish color. There's lots of changes in the pituitary gland as well. And I'll let you stop the video and take a look at all of these. And I've given you some um, tables to refer to. And the nutritional needs. We want to make sure that a woman is 
the eating the best that she's ever eaten when she's pregnant because what she is eating is what she's going to grow her baby out of. So um, there, we want an increase in protein, iron, folate, and calories. There is a USDA My Plate guide for pregnancy. I'll show you a picture of that. And then there are certain foods that we want to avoid because women are prone. Um, their immune systems are decreased. And so they are prone to um, infection like listeria, listeriosis, listeria. And um, but those come from cheeses and um, some other foods. And then there's high mercury content in some fish and during pregnancy, we don't want to have an increase in our mercury. It can affect, affect development. So uh, here's an example of what a um, well-balanced diet is. And I know there's a lot of talk about diet out there nowadays. Uh, these diets were developed based on years and years and years of, of research and looking down at the molecular level of how we utilize certain components of the foods. It's always better to get things from food than it is from a supplement because supplements are um, synthetic most of the time. And so um, here's a good example. Now we do have to keep in mind there are lots of cultural um, uh, influences in diet. And we have lots of uh, diet choices such as veganism or vegetarianism that can affect pregnancy as well. Maternal weight gain, we have an ideal weight uh, that we would like moms to gain. We, if their BMI is normal, so if the BMI is in the normal range, which is under 25, we want them to gain about 25 to 35 pounds. If they are underweight before they get pregnant, then we want them to gain a little more. And if they're overweight, then we want them to gain a little less. Uh, again, like I said, we want to look at some of those cultural variations and um, uh, promote as much as possible a well-balanced diet if we can. There's something called pica, which is an unusual occurrence that happens sometimes in pregnancy, sometimes outside of pregnancy. You may have seen this when you studied mental health, but pica is one of those um, conditions that we have to be on the lookout for. It is eating non-food substances. And when you're pregnant and have pica and have certain cravings for non-food substances, it's usually related to a dietary insufficiency. So we um, try to promote trust with our moms and uh, hopefully they will tell us about their desire to eat these things. Um, some of them can be dangerous. We, here's a list of actual different types of pica, starch and paste, soil, clay, and chalk, those are pretty common. And those are related usually to an iron deficiency. So we um, want to discuss this with them, let them know that, uh, you know, get them on a vitamin supplementation it, or other foods if they are exhibiting some of these um, desires. There's lots of emotions that come along with being pregnant and sometimes women will move in and out of these and it is um, perfectly acceptable as we go throughout our life. We have lots of role changes and this is a big one for a lot of people. Of course, it depends on the current circumstances, if they feel supported, if they're in a relationship, if this was a wanted pregnancy, um, lots of things will influence the emotional response. And as um, nurses and providers, we definitely want to um, be open to discussing that with them. Sexual, sexuality may change. Um, women start to feel differently about their changing bodies. Some have a sexual desire change with each trimester if they're feeling terrible in the first trimester, but then starting to feel a little bit better in the second trimester. Some women really enjoy sexual contact during pregnancy and some women don't. And again, it's going to be each individual woman and her partner um, expressing that. The partner, whether whoever that may be, um, is going to have their own emotion and role change that goes along with this. Many partners are not fully, um, they don't fully 
they accept the pregnancy, but they don't fully get it until the baby's actually here. They're not having the same experience as feeling the baby move inside them and feeling their body change and grow. And so some partners do have what we call a cuvade syndrome, which is uh, also termed a sympathetic pregnancy where they gain weight and they have aches and pains and kind of goes along with their partner. But um, others really are not fully um, accepting or, you know, just it doesn't really hit them until the baby is actually here. And you see that with their reaction. Siblings also have to have a role change and some do very well. It usually depends on the age of the child. And there are some classes and supports out there for siblings that are getting ready to be um, changing their role and um, they're recommended. We recommend that, that families involve their child as much as possible. Thanks so much for joining me today. If you have questions, reach out.